This week's episode is brought to you by the Watasco and Arts and Music Festival Committee, Delcon Visual Arts, and Warren's Music. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor of the Watasco Wonkcast, here's how. Go to our website at Delcon Visual Arts forward slash Wonkcast and send us a message there. Or you can find us on Facebook at Watasco and Wonkcast and you can send us a message there too. Standing on a precipice Looking out over the edge Laughing all its calamities Have driven you to this land All you can do Is look down You can't see the sky I can see you standing there I wonder why It's not over yet, my friend Say hello to the sun Have a right to let go of your pain Smile again You wandered on to this path Such a long time ago Now you're looking around you Wondering what it is you have to show So many things you would have done So many things you could have said You're standing there lonely What's going on in your head? It's not over yet, my friend. Say hello to the sun again. Have the right to let go of your pain. That you could teach How do you know It's time to let go It's not over yet My friend Say hello to the sun Again to let go of pain and smile again let go of that pain smile again Possum Bill Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, Justin's not in today, uh, so it's going to be just me and Bill Tozer are returning as a guest to our Wonkcast. Glad to have you. That's a great way to start the show. And thanks for being here on such short notice. But uh, 
for those of you wondering, Justin had to take his mom out for a birthday dinner. So, you know, priorities. That's the way it goes. So. Well, you know, you can't mess around with your mom's birthday. No, you can't miss that. No. The last time you were here, Bill, we were talking about uh, you were going to open up um, uh, not a music studio, but a training um, music training music, studio. music instruction, whatever you want to call it. How's that coming along? Well, it's coming along pretty good, but uh, you know, like many of the buildings in town with flat roofs, uh, got some leaking problems this winter with this nasty winter we had. So, just having to get those tidied up before we can finish the uh, other alterations and get opening. It's not just me teaching at the studio. It'll be available for other people to, to rent and to use. And uh, the idea is to make it a community facility. Uh, hopefully, the roof uh, has to have a, a series of 10 degrees and warmer, and we ha definitely haven't had that yet. So uh, I'm hoping that in May, we can get the roof uh, addressed properly, and then we'll uh, we'll look at opening in June. Getting back to the working portion of what you're going to be doing, the the age ranges of your students. What are you looking at to focus on? Well, for the uh, the ORF method, the sing, dance, play, be uh, younger children um, for sure. Four and five-year-olds on up, looking at two- and three-year-olds because there is interest for that. I have to take a little bit of extra training in the summer for that. And so I'm, I'm working on getting that training into my schedule. I'll also be offering it for adults and uh, seniors and, of course, youth. And I'm looking at also some therapeutic uses for the program and uh, hope to be exploring that with a couple of the societies here in town. Um, by therapeutic, was that mean? Well, it has been used with great success uh, for things like dementia, um, helping people recover from strokes and, and other brain injuries, and has been shown to be very beneficial in terms of helping create, because it's just a series of fun things, a stress-free uh, atmosphere that that just encourages them to, to do more, to stretch out just that little bit. Oh, I, I totally get that because music is such a great um, stress reliever for me myself. I mean, when I'm feeling uptight, it's head to the basement, grab the guitar, and just go bang out a few notes and calm yourself down. And yes, and uh, that's, that's the whole thing. And if you can get somebody who hasn't been doing a lot of things like that to express themselves getting out and, and pounding on the table you know just doing the, the table drummer tap 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 yeah. can can really help soothe you know, the savage beast um, and really relax somebody who's otherwise very tense and all the things that they can't do what is your method of teaching say a uh... 10 or 12 year old child comes in and wants to learn guitar. What's one of the very first things that you would talk to them about or show them or what's your process? Well, my process is a little bit different than some. I like to get them sitting down and trying a guitar if they don't already own one. I have a number in the studio of left and right handed guitars. So sit them down, explain basic posture, the way to hold the guitar that is going to do uh, no damage to the wrist and uh, create carpal tunnel, that kind of thing. Some basic physiology first, and then talk to them about what they're wanting to get out of the guitar. What do they see themselves as being in the way of a guitarist? And from there, and based on what they know, already on the guitar, if they know anything. Um, I try to build a plan for that particular individual. And I will incorporate things like pseudo-rhythms, so nonsense words that create the rhythm in the mind to help them understand notation and what notation is trying to get them to understand rhythmically. And I will often start 
in a very unusual place. I'll start on the D string. If I'm teaching them notation first, if that's the first of the, of the things that we want to accomplish, because that's the bottom of the natural staff. And can lead them up the four strings. And if it's a younger person, they may be on a baritone ukulele rather than a guitar, which is a four stringed instrument that starts on the D string. So by getting them comfortable with the, the staff without any ledger lines, I find that it helps them get comfortable with reading notation a little bit differently. It also gets them into the middle of the guitar so they feel they're doing something. They're not hanging on the outside strings. And, so that's also assuming that your student has some working knowledge on how to read music? Well, no, we, we go through the basics. First, it's notation. Uh, it's rhythmic notation. So what's a quarter note? What does a, uh, a measure of quarter notes sound like? What does a measure of mixed sound like? Uh, as we get into each level, we'll clap out the rhythms. We'll tap out the rhythms. We'll stroke the rhythm with the pick, striking independent strings. I'll get them doing finger exercises to stretch and build strength. And I will also do a bunch of old-style bass lines to give them something they can do right away that feels like something close to what they're yeah, interested in. Yeah, it gives them a sense of accomplishment. They, you know, if they can play off a couple of bass lines and then settle into some basic chording and, and other things. They gives more positive feedback than just starting on the high E string and working yeah. your way up the guitar. Because the guitar, everybody, well, I shouldn't say everybody, but a lot of people think, oh, look, he's playing a guitar. How hard is that? There's a lot more to it than people even realize it's not just placing your fingers on the fretboard saying, hey, I made the G chord or whatever, right? Yeah, no, there's, you know, so much timing involved in it and little nuances and how you pick the strings or strum with your fingers and just, I don't know, it's just incredible. I've been playing a long time and I'm still learning new things, you know, so... After 50-some years, I'm still doing basic flat pick exercises. Yeah. Getting to cross strings better, more efficiently. Picking up my speed on, on faster runs. And that's all practice, practice, practice. Yes. And that's the, one of the big things that everybody starting guitar has to understand, uh, is that it, in its own way, is more complicated than the piano. Because... You know, in some instances, you've got as many as five different places to play that note. And there's a reason to play it in each of those places. Oh, for it's a it's particular it's, yeah, the, the nuance uh, application. Sound, yeah. Whether it's tonal or whether it's, okay, I've got a, the next note is way out of the reach of, of my normal place of playing that note. And you have to know your fretboard. Uh, which is 22 frets, six strings, 132 glorious combinations of identification. Yeah, and the big point there is you've got to know your fretboard, definitely. Because I remember starting out how hard it was for me. I, I don't learn by watching, I learn by doing. And it took me forever. I started playing guitar when I was about 14. 14 years old, I guess, and it took me at least, I'm a slow learner, so it took me at least five to ten years to even be remotely familiar with the keyboard, or sorry, the fretboard. I, I, I can't play piano, so. Well, it does help that from the 12th fret up, it's a repeat of the bottom 12. Yeah, yeah. And once you, once you get that locked into your mind, it, it makes it a lot easier because you're not having to learn such a mass so quickly. And there are, uh, as you learn your scales and modes and like the pentatonic scales and positionings, you can build a set of references so that you can swing through the guitar from key to key without going absolutely crazy. There are many different ways of learning that. And some of us 
struggle and, and learn it note by fret by note, uh, which is the way that I started learning it. And, you know, got lucky and found an old heavy guitar Bible. It had the pentatonic scale laid out on the fretboard for the key of A and the key of C. And had the six main finger stations for that broken up. And that gave me the basis for understanding where those patterns would be everywhere else, which was the whole idea behind the book. Yeah. They'd give you a taster and then make you chase. And because they're, you know, they've broken it into beautiful blocks. And I see on the internet there are people who are who are following that and, and trying to make it sound like it's their own system and, and stuff. But it's been around for a long, long time. And the one thing it does is you really understand why certain guitarists have a, their certain favorite positions in a particular key. If you if you watch them play, like if you watch Warren Haynes play, he locks in a very tight space box, box yeah. um, that allows him to flow on either side, and he does it very, very well and seamlessly. But he under, understands that interplay and the pattern that it follows. It doesn't matter what key it's in. The pattern doesn't, doesn't change. It just shifts fret by fret depending on the key you're in. Well, with that being said, I've, I've, I've noticed a good amount of guitar players have a favorite spot on the fretboard, like myself included. This is... Yeah. It's a comfort zone. You know you can go a little bit faster there if you have to, or sometimes you, the person, think it just sounds better, right? Yeah. Well, but, you, you have the safety of your, of your home notes. You know exactly where they are in, yeah. the, in that spot. So you know that uh, whether you think of it in that in technical or, or music theory terms of first and fifth or, you know, you're thinking I'm in the C chord, and so my C and G notes are where I would need to hang. Or those two sound good. <laughs> this one and this one, they're where I need to to end off if I'm gonna hang. <laughs> uh, it's all the same. It's all the same basic idea. It's just how organized those thoughts are. So we're gonna step back just a little bit here at the top of this podcast. You um, you were playing a a nice tune there, and obviously that's uh, self written. And uh, what's the title of it, and how did that come to fruition? Okay, that one came to fruition, uh, as many songs do. Getting ready to close down my computer shop and eventually move here to Wetaskiwin from Pinoka. Was a, uh, it was a song that came to me. It was a song about the chain, about changes and, and uh, the natural fears and hesitations and, you know, how similar that is in some ways to somebody standing on the ledge, just frozen. Yeah. Kind of like uh, Jesus was the next sort of thing, what do I do now? Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, the familiar safety net or nets are gone for whatever reason. And where do I go? And, you know, the, the feelings are, are, you know, either stronger or weaker, but they're all basically, where do I go? What do I do? You know, everything's changed. And maybe nothing's changed to anybody else on the planet. But to you, the person experiencing the shift, everything has changed. And... Uh, so what's the title of the track, Bill? Well, that one is called Letting Go. Let it go. Pretty straightforward. Yeah, oh, letting go, not let it oh, go. Oh, yes. But, uh, and uh, it was a part of uh, that period of writing that I was doing when I was dismantling my computer business. And so it's got personal meanings to you. Yeah, for sure. Personal meanings. And I've had some people appreciate the song, so... Right. And continue to play it in my repertoire rather than yeah. shelve it. You know. that, it means something to you, why not? Right. Yeah. So this summer, again, we're going to get back to the Wetaskiwin Arts and Music Festival. Uh, you said you're going to be a part of that again. Oh, definitely. Uh, I had a wonderful time last year. 
and it was wonderful exposure. It was wonderful to meet all sorts of different people and get a chance to show them the ORF instruments and things at the, the table we had set up. And it was great to play to a different audience than usually I'm playing to. Um, this event takes a lot of work, and it's not just uh, by the founder or Susan. Uh, it takes a committee. And this event is for the people, not just the artists and musicians, but for the, the community. And that's what it's basically about. Um, we are going to be reaching out a little further in, in the future for surrounding area or Wetaskiwin County and stuff like that to get more people involved. But it, it, it's to get involved, it's it's pretty simple. Go to the Facebook page. You can uh, talk to Bonnie Brown. Uh, she's the one looking after the, all that. And you can also come down here to Dalcon Visual Arts. And I have a, a sign-up sheet here and you know, if, uh, it's a $10 registration, $10 for each table. I mean, where are you going to go anywhere else and pay an entry fee of $10 for something like this? I mean, uh, good luck. And that is an entry fee for people who are putting on displays and things. There's no fee for the people coming to the... Exactly, yeah. The, it's, it's free the for venue. the people to attend. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the whole idea is to have a free family event that is truly family friendly that covers pretty well the whole park I would imagine this time I mean it covered a good chunk of the park last uh, on the very first time yeah it's, it's going to be pretty much the same setup <clears throat> there might be a uh, we're hoping to have a few more artists and musicians this year but it's a lot of work we're getting it there. We're almost there, but we'll be ready to go. There's not a problem. Um, like we said, entry fee is $10, $10 per table if you need it, or you can bring your own table. If you have a table, that's fine. I myself will be there. I'm going to have a couple tables set up, and I'm going to be displaying some of my photography that I put on canvas and prints and also, what services uh, we offer at the gallery. And a lot, well, not a lot, up, but a few of the photographers around town have uh, used our services. So I'm sure they'll have some of those on display. And a few of the artists that are here in the gallery are, will also be um, on display there. Cindy Calnay, Bonnie Brown, uh, just to name a couple. Uh, you, yourself as a musician, I've known you for a long time. And... You're going to be there um, singing your songs and promoting your own business. And, uh, again, just more community-minded stuff. Exactly. Uh, getting out to the community, letting people know that they're, if they want to teach a course, that there's a facility that is available, available and reasonably priced as an alternative to some of the other great facilities that we have that are sometimes a little bit out of the the pocketbook uh, range of of a beginning teacher or a, a beginning instructor and so i hope to just help the uh, community build and and the the arts stretch out its fingers into the uh, entire city and county well i've noticed <clears throat> excuse me i've been here Oh, 17 years now, and I think in one of our previous guests, Lori Kennedy, he was mentioning about how there was a great music community. Then it kind of went away. Now it seems to be making a resurgence. It's just getting more and more people involved, people involved in the arts and music scene. So have you noticed anything in the time you've been here? Or? I, I have. I've, I've noticed that there's more young people playing acoustic music, which is very satisfying to me as a, as a musician, because all you hear about is, oh, kids aren't interested in the uh, traditional instruments. They just want to be able to do it on their iPad and stuff. And I find that the the many of the serious ones, not all of the serious ones, but many of the serious ones are pulling back to traditional mm -hmm. musical instruments and maybe not using them in traditional ways. That's what music's about, you know, making your own. Exactly. 
one of the best drummers I know. Plays the stands as well as most drummers play the drums. Uh, it's true. He's, yeah. he's incredible. Uh, and I know a couple of Tilo who played with uh, Carlos Santana in the day and uh, is in Edmonton nowadays. He is one of those drummers who can utilize any part of his kit, including the stands, to create a sound that he can't get off any of his drums or percussion instruments. He's quite happy to be using his sticks on the bottom of his cymbal uh, stand. Well, music, whether it be a string instrument or the drums, I mean, it's a freedom of expression. Um, if you're going to do a rim shot, or it's, it's more than just beating the skins. I mean, use the top of your cymbal to make that sound, you know, or whatever. It's going to fit in somewhere. Well, yes. And, you know, people, a lot of kids have got... Uh, very, very interested in the various tunings for guitar. Mm -hmm. You know, open tunings have definitely made a big comeback because of people, artists like Serena Ryder and I'm trying to think of a couple of others that, that use the tunings. Yeah, and she's going to happen to soon. Soon, yeah, very yeah. soon. Yeah. Very, very soon. Um, and it's really interesting to see how people... Can use them, but of course now the keyboard is is such a different instrument than what it was when you and I were growing up, and it was either grandma's organ or the piano. Yeah, and it was a strange thing to find a honky tonk piano or an electric piano with like a Rhodes with a different sound was just something that you never saw. I mean, I can remember when I first saw a Hammond B three with a Leslie speaker on stage in a rock band. You know, it was a huge, literally, and very heavy yeah. <laughs> revelation, especially when I had to help carry it off the stage. Now the keyboard can create almost any sound. String instruments, saxophone, trumpet, human voice. Human I mean, voices, animal crazy. voices. Yeah. Sound effects. You know, we were listening a little earlier to uh, postmodern jukebox, treating modern day songs as if they were written in the 20s and, and just coming at them from a totally different angle. I heard a young lady do an incredible version of a Johnny Cash song, and she did it in a sort of a semi reggae with a totally different chord progression than the, than the original. And uh, these kind of things are, are the kind of things I hope to see happen more and more in my studio and see more and more in our music community. So speaking of the community, um, Manluck Theatre has an open mic night every second Saturday, and that starts April 21st, which is actually today. I very rarely miss one of those, so I'll be there tonight, and hopefully uh, people show up because uh, the theater had a, a, the play Annie going on for the last two weekends, which was uh, pretty successful. Um, they were close to a sellout for both weekends, so big shout out to them. We'd also like to thank Warren's Music for being a sponsor, Tasco and Arts and Music Festival, and that happens on June 23rd this year. It's that Saturday, I believe it is. I yeah. So. And that runs from 9.30 in the morning till 9.30 at night. So um, mark that in your calendars. Be there. Like we said, there's no cost to uh, come see what's going on. Uh, anything else you'd like to throw out there, Bill? Well, I imagine uh, we should mention that uh, last year there was transport. Because of the parking situation, they had transport from downtown. Uh, actually from the, the rec complex, was it? Uh, this, yeah, the drill hall. The drill hall, yeah. and, and that that will probably uh, will be going on again this year. I would yeah, imagine. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, so that there's more one way than one way to get there, and there's more than one way to find parking. Yeah, because there's pretty limited out there, and for the amount of people that came through last year, there's no way you're gonna be able to find a spot. Let's just put it that way. Just go to the drill hall, and I think. There's also a space up at the mall where they're going to be uh, shuttling people. I could be wrong. Correct me. I'm sure they will. Um, if not, I'll update the next uh, 
podcasts we have on exact locations for shuttles. Which sounds great. Uh, an additional place uh, gives more ability for people to, uh, to come and attend. Seniors who are close to the mall, and there's a couple of seniors' homes close to that mall, uh, would be able to, to get onto the bus, the shuttle there, and, and come out and enjoy what was an incredibly enjoyable day. Yeah, and I want to be perfectly clear that this is an alcohol-free <coughs> event. Um, so if you're coming out expecting to have a beer and sit back and listen to some music, it's not going to happen unless you sneak it in. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't recommend that. Yeah, we don't recommend that at all. No. No. Loonstock is coming. Loonstock <laughs> is coming. <laughs> yeah. And you can do that there. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of booze there. Yeah, you can do that. And that's August 18th, I believe it is. Again, I'll give you an update on our next podcast. But uh, maybe next podcast we'll go through uh, an entire rundown of what's coming up this summer and dates and times. And if you're local, uh, come check it out. I mean, support local. That's that's how cities survive. That's how communities survive. So. Now, Dale, as I recall, last year we had a couple of stages at the festival, and there was a number of different opportunities for people to play and sing, and that it, it didn't all—you didn't have to feel that you were a professional musician to actually get out and prefer, perform on the stages. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, it's a lot like the open mics at the theater. I mean, we're not there to criticize. We're not there to make fun of anybody. We're there to play our music, enjoy the music, and Support and it's you. and again, I got to stress with the open mics, it's not just music. If you want to come up and read us a, a poem or a sonnet, or you have a improv, that's what I'm looking for. Thank you. Uh, we've had people do magic acts. We've had. <laughs> We've had cowboy poets. We had a rapper who played trumpet. Yeah. I mean, we've had all sorts of different things at the theater in the open mic. And players from the age of seven or less right up to 80. You know? And I mean, as it's now that we're in the, the theater itself on the Kim To stage, bring your band. Play a few songs if you want to try something out in front of the of a crowd it's yeah. pretty simple it's a lot of room there we got drums we got amplifiers usually bring your own instruments so that's preferred yeah you know. and if you have a pedal board that you're addicted to of course bring it because it's part of your instrument yeah, yeah for sure yeah yeah as a guitar player i can say that <laughs> nothing worse than wandering onto stage and then finding you can't get the sound you're used to and then it just to you, it sounds like crap, right? So, yeah. yeah it, or it's just not as good anyway. Well, it throws you off. You start second-guessing yourself because you're you're not hearing what you're used to hearing. And the same thing is true with uh, keyboard players, I've noticed, um, that it's it's equally as strong with them. Yeah, there, <clears throat> there is keyboards and there's a piano there. If you're that it intent on getting your sound, then lug your own, bring it in, right? Uh, we also have saxophone player Olive, and she's actually going to be our uh, our guest next week. Awesome! Yeah, Olive's uh, taking a leap of faith with us, and she's gonna <laughs> she, she's going to come out and uh, let us grill her. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it should be interesting. With that being said, um, I guess we'll close this down. Again, Justin wasn't here this week. Obviously, you can tell. Um, he'll be back next week, as far as we know. And our next guest will be Olive. She's a local saxophone player, self-taught, from as far as I know. And that should be a good interview. So I want to say thanks to Bill Tozer for showing up again for our uh, episode 11 11 already. Wow, this really went by fast. And it's been a lot of fun. So thanks again, Bill. And we'll catch everybody next Thank you. Goodbye. This week's episode is brought to you by the Watasco and Arts and Music Festival Committee, Delcon Visual Arts, and Warren's Music. <laughs>